Praise the Lord, everybody. It is a good thing to give thanks to the Lord in the blessed name. Can we honor the Lord tonight? Can we honor him tonight for his faithfulness, for his wonderful works? We serve a mighty God. Won't you give him a mighty praise tonight? All across the world, let's praise Jesus. All across the world, let's praise Jesus. Hallelujah. Lift Jesus higher tonight. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Glory to God. We've come to celebrate him tonight. We've come to magnify him and make his praise great. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Come on, let's go. Be glorified. You got to put your hands on this. that your name is great that your name is mighty and that because your name is glorious because your name is strong we honor the name of Jesus and we worship you today come on let's sing this to him Jehovah is your name come on everybody your name. your name. Jehovah is your name. Jehovah Lift it to Jesus. Jehovah is your name. Come on. He's a mighty warrior. Mighty warrior. Great in battle. Jehovah is 
your name. Your name. Hallelujah. You're a mighty warrior, God, you are. And we give you praise today. to bless him and to celebrate him and to worship him. Hallelujah to Jesus. Can you just give him your best praise? Hallelujah. Hallelujah to Jesus. Hallelujah to Jesus. Hallelujah. Jehovah is your name. Mighty warrior, mighty warrior, mighty warrior. Jehovah. Jehovah is your name. Your name. Mighty warrior, mighty warrior. Mighty warrior. Great in battle. Jehovah. Your name. Your name. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Hallelujah. Don't stop praising him. Our God is worthy to be praised. And as you're joining us in the online sanctuary and coming up the timeline and worshiping with us here, we just came to remind you, just in case you needed a reminder, that we serve the true and the living God. A God who is capable. A God who is able. A God whose name is Jehovah. The unchangeable God. The covenant keeping God. And no matter what you and I go through, here's what we celebrate. He fights our battles and he always wins. <laughs> he never loses. Hallelujah! Anybody excited about the fact that God never loses a battle? He's a mighty warrior. He's great in battle. Jehovah is his name. Hallelujah to the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords as you take, if you can, in the presence of our God. My God, hallelujah. 
I am Reverend Thea A. Wilson. It is indeed a privilege and an honor to serve here as one of the associate pastors and the director of the civic engagement ministry here at this church. And my job here tonight is to guide us through this communion worship experience where we gather as a family once a month to remember the price that Jesus paid on the cross to redeem us from the penalty of sin and eternal death. Anybody glad that Jesus got up out of that grave and the Holy Spirit raised him from the dead with what? All power in his hands. Hallelujah. Well, at this time, it is customary that we prepare our hearts and minds for the reading of God's holy word. Tonight's scripture is found in 1 Corinthians, the 11th chapter. We will begin reading verses 23 through 30 as you access your Bibles at this time. We are always reminded here at First Baptist by our pastor and our church, we don't just want to access our Bibles on Sundays. We want to read our Bibles, how often? Daily, amen, to know God. The word of God reads, for I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you that the Lord Jesus on the same night in which he was betrayed took bread. And we, when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, take, eat. This is my body which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in the same manner, he also took the cup after supper saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death till he comes. Therefore, whoever eats this bread or drinks this cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of the body and blood of the Lord. But let a man examine himself. And so let him eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For he who eats and drinks in an unworthy manner eats and drinks judgment to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. For this reason, many are weak and sick among you, and many sleep. This is the word of the Lord, which is forever settled. Please pray with me. God, our Father, God, our Savior, the Son, and God with us, Holy Spirit. God, we acknowledge your presence with us tonight, and we welcome you into this worship experience. God, there's nothing that we can do without you. You are the very breath that we breathe. What would we do? Where would we go? What would we become if you withdrew your help from us, God? We need you every second and minute and an hour of each and every day. You are our buckler, God. You are our shield. You are our strong tower. And we are grateful and so thankful, God, that when we run to you, we are so safe. Thank you, God, for being a covenant-keeping God. Forgive us of our sins, Father. Creating us clean hearts and renewing us steadfast spirits, God. We thank you for your word that says that you will forgive us if we confess our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. We love you for being such a faithful and forgiving God. You're so loving kind toward us, God. Lord, we pray on behalf of your people tonight that you supernaturally meet their needs according to your riches and glory by Christ Jesus. 
Lord, we stand in agreement, God, that you heal, deliver, and set free. God, we thank you for our pastor and our shepherd here and for our first lady and their entire family, God. We pray, Lord, that you continue to cover them as they cover us in, with pastoral care. God, and we pray for the speaker of the hour, God. We ask that you use him mightily, God, to draw the unsaved, the unchurched, and the unsure. This is our prayer. We are reminded that we don't even know what we, we need in prayer. And so we ask that you intercede on our behalf. Oh, great and mighty God. We love you and we're so full of joy because of the price that you pay. Please hear our prayer. And we pray this prayer in the name and through the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. And amen. I do believe that God hears and that God answers prayer. Do you believe it with me? With my whole being, I believe he heard our prayer. At this time, we want to welcome those of you who are worshiping with us for the very first time. I'd like to officially welcome you to the First Baptist Church of Glen Arden International on behalf of our senior pastor, Pastor John K. Jenkins Sr., our First Lady, Lady Trina Jenkins, our church leadership, and our entire church family. We welcome you here. Our vision and our mission is to use every resource that God has provided to us to grow and mature the body of Christ worldwide. Amen. And there is a QR code that's being displayed on the screens that gives you a little snapshot about how we develop our members here. It provides uh, all our activities for the week. It also provides you an opportunity to interact with us here in our worship experience. There's a Bible app on that link. I ask you to take your phones and hover over the QR code. It's really neat. Uh, technology has come a long, long way. You can just click a button and there you have all of our activity at your fingertips. You can also give using this link. Again, we thank you so much for joining us here. And if you are worshiping with us for the very first time, we ask that you put a number one if you're worshiping with us online. Uh, and our online host will help me greet you. And if you're here in the sanctuary and you are a first time guest, we are gonna ask that you stand at this time. Amen, first time guest here in the sanctuary. Please stand. Amen. Uh, well, God bless you. Amen. God bless you. Thank you so much for coming. First Baptist family, can you help me greet our first time guests safely? Everybody say safely. As we greet one another and hear from our praise team. Amen.
take your place. She will take your place. This Wednesday, July 27th, is the semi-annual church business meeting. Registration for this video conference meeting is required for all FBCG members in good standing. See the church website for members to register to view and participate. Elder John S. Terry passed away on April 4th, 2020. Due to the onset of the pandemic, our church was not able to celebrate his life or bring comfort to his family as a church leader. Join us as we acknowledge his significant contribution to our church and seek to love and comfort his family. Service is Monday, July 25th at First Baptist Church of Glen Arden Ministry Center, 3600 Bright Seat Road, Landover, Maryland. The visitation will begin at 10 a.m., followed by the service at 11 a.m. The latest issue of Vision Magazine is now available online. It keeps you connected and informed about different activities and events occurring at First Baptist Church of Glen Arden International. The magazine is also a resource to share testimonies and spotlight outstanding service from members. See the latest issue on the church website at fbcglenarden.org slash publications. That's the news for this week. You can find more details about these events and others on our church website at fbcglenarden.org. Amen. First Baptist, please remember to be mindful of our church announcements as we continue in worship through the giving of our tithes and our offerings. Amen. To participate in this aspect of giving, the instructions to participate electronically are being displayed on our monitors. You can also give cash or write a check to the acronym made payable, I'm sorry, made payable to FBCG, which is the acronym for First Baptist Church of Glen Arden. You can mail your gifts into our church, or if you're here in the sanctuary, you can complete an offering envelope, and at the conclusion of our service, take your offerings to one of our offering boxes. If you can't find a box, one of our ushers will be glad to assist. 
we thank you for those of you who align your faith to God's principles of giving. You do so in such an extraordinary way here at First Baptist Church of Glen Arden International, and the impact is unmeasurable. Do so in tangible ways, uh, through uh, feeding the hungry, clothing the naked. We are the hands and feet of God in the community and all over the world, and in tangible ways as well, your impact can be felt. People's gifts are being unleashed, God-given gifts, as well as their purposes. That is priceless. How many of you have found your purpose in God here at First Baptist? I know I have. And so that is so, so impactful. And we thank you for being a part of this great work. And if we're already, let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for these gifts and we ask that you bless them and receive them now, Father, for the upbuilding of your kingdom here on earth. And we pray this prayer in the precious name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Well, it has been an honor to serve in this capacity, and I thank you for the privilege. And following the next ministry of song, I'm going to ask that you turn your attention to the monitors for the introduction of our illustrious guest speaker tonight, Dr. Moore. God bless you.
teaching pastor at Christ Church of the Valley, CCV, in Peoria, Arizona. CCV is a non-denominational church with over 30,000 in weekly attendance across multiple campuses. Prior to joining the CCV team, Dr. Moore was a professor at Ozark Christian College in Joplin, Missouri for 22 years. He is also an adjunct professor at Johnson University and Haas Idolize in Vienna, Austria. Dr. Moore is also the author and co-author of many books, including Core 52 and Quest 52. His life passion is to make Jesus famous. Please welcome Dr. Mark Moore. Thank you. You can have a seat. I, I just got to tell you how I got here. You know, pastor is in this master's program, which I think is, I think that's just legit, right? It was about two days into this, uh, into this program, and he's in this cohort with, with these gigachurch pastors, men and women of influence from all around the country. And I look up their bios, and I remember before we ever met, I, I, I called you the senator. And he denied it. And that may be the only time I'll ever call you a liar, but brother, you've got this influence that is majestic. And it was, it was about the second day on the trip, pastor came to me and said, have you ever pre preached at an all-black church? I don't know why he would ever question that. I said, no, but it's about time. I have been looking forward to preaching in your church for months until I heard you preach this morning. I almost just went home. <laughs> I cannot do that. I mean, I knew this man as this, like, he was humble and quiet, and, and, and yet something happened to you on stage. It was the opposite of demon possession. <laughs> something happened where I saw the real Pastor John K. Jenkins come out. It was something else. That was something else. It would, because of uh, federal laws of educational privacy, I'm not able to tell you that I gave him an A in the class. Even if he didn't earn an A in the class, I would have given him an A in the class. I can't prove it, but I'm pretty sure that anybody gives this man less than an A could go to hell. <laughs> and then I meet the first lady. Pastor, I, I could be wrong, but I think they got louder for that one than you. How, how is that possible? We went out to dinner with him, my wife and I. Barbara's right on the front row. Wave your hand, Barbara. I thought I was going to lose her. I didn't think she'd come home with me after dinner with the first lady. And then you all, it's so kind to invite me in and for you to bring Aretha Franklin to sing right before I preach. I mean, come on. What a blessing. And I'm just going to confess before the Lord right now, when I go back home to our church, I'm going to be hard to live with for about a month. 
your, your kindness and your honor has just blessed our hearts. Thank you. Thank you for having us. Yesterday, I got to speak to the graduates of your discipleship program. I see men in blue here. I see the ladies in white, Congratula and gentlemen in white, congratulations on that accomplishment. So this is part two of yesterday's message. I wanted to talk to you about a young man named John Mark. And the title of this message is that your biography doesn't have to be your story. And because my name is Mark, I feel a kinship with John Mark and the body. Do you know about John Mark? Anybody? He had some failures early on. But none of his failures were because of his character. He was honestly trying to do for God what was right and best. He just didn't have the maturity. And I, I could tell you a few of my stories of failures in my early years. I wanted to do the right thing. I just, I was just young and dumb. And so if you wouldn't mind, for the next couple minutes, I want you to imagine that I am John Mark from the Bible, and I want to tell you a story first person and scene. <laughs> when I was a younger man, he was at my house. I mean, he, the master, was at my house. Okay, so it wasn't my house. It was my mama's house. Mary, it was her house. But it was the house in the early days of the Christians, in the center of the old city of Jerusalem. Our house was the house where the apostles came. And that night, they came for dinner. Man, I wish I was invited. I wasn't. It was upstairs. I was downstairs. But when they were in the upper room, I was in my bed just list. I was straining to hear. Mama didn't let me go up, but I was listening. I couldn't hear much, but when they raised their voices, I could hear some. Like, <laughs> I heard Peter when he said, well, then wash my whole body. I had no idea what that was all about. But then I heard what I could hear were footsteps. And there was one set of footsteps went down those stairs. I didn't know who it was until later. While later, I'm listening, trying to hear just glimpses of what Jesus was saying. How would I know that was his last night on this earth? How would I know that that was his last supper? Where he instituted what all of this is all about. I was there. Well, I wasn't there. I was downstairs. They were upstairs. Then I heard 12 other footsteps go down the stairs, Jesus and the other 11. And then I heard, a few minutes later, it wasn't a knock. It was a banging at our door. And when Mom and I went to open the door, I could not believe my eyes. I was so angry. I could have killed him. He was standing right there with 600 soldiers behind him. And I knew then who it was that went down the stairs early. It was Judas. And he was looking for Jesus. And he, I'd heard Jesus say that one of you will betray me. I heard that. But nobody would have believed it was him. He was the treasurer of the group. He was on the inside. He had a seat right next to Jesus. I was, I could have killed him. And I knew where they were going because we didn't just own a house in Jerusalem. We also had, it was a little outside of Jerusalem on the Mount of Olives, we had an olive grove. It was a garden with a wall, a protected private place where Jesus, he prayed there all the time. I knew that's where he was going and Judas knew that's where he was going to. I was going to make a beeline to get there, but 600 soldiers, they take a long time to clear the street. By the time the last one turned the corner, I couldn't take the straight route to the garden. I had to run the long way around, and I ran as fast as, fast as I could. But I was too late. 
I'm running up the hill. I just break through the gate, and I see Iscariot there, and he kissed him. I saw that. I could have killed him. In fact, Peter tried. He was in the front, and I don't know, I think it was the butcher's knife they carved the Passover lamb with, but he pulled that out. He couldn't get to Judas, but Malchus was standing there. He tried to give Malchus a haircut at the collarbone. He wasn't aiming at his ear. Malchus was just faster than the old fisherman, and he ducked, and the ear flew, and I, I, I was close enough at that point that I heard Jesus say, permit me this. And the guards let him go, and he picked up the ear. This is not a fairy tale. I was there. I saw him snap that back on. And I was wondering about that soldier that had to take his arms behind his back again. That seemed like a foolish move to me. When you're snapping on body parts, you can snap them off too. And Jesus said, Peter, you put that thing away. You're going to put someone's eye out. And when Jesus took away the only weapon we knew how to use, everybody ran. Everybody ran. And I'm standing there. I'm embarrassed to tell you this, but I was in bed. All I had on was my linen shirt. I didn't have the outer cloak on. I just had the linen shirt. And before, well, linen, we were rich. We had money. And when someone grabbed the back of my shirt, it was one of those soldiers. I was quick like Malchus. I slipped right out of it. I was naked. Well, not buck naked. I had a loincloth on, but still, that's embarrassing. And I ran home and seen. You think I might be making that up, but I'm not. <laughs> I, I got all of that from the Gospel of Mark. You, you know this verse? It's a weird verse. It's the only verse in the Bible that talks about a streaker. <laughs> and the only person who is interested in a streaker is a streaker himself. I don't know if you've ever done that. Some of you grew up in the 70s. Maybe you did. But it says here, a young man followed him in verse 51 with nothing but a linen cloth about his body, and they seized him. But he left the linen cloth and ran away naked. Now, why would Mark put that in the gospel? Because he's telling a bigger story than his own story. He wasn't the only one naked. Jesus was naked. And he was all alone, and Mark knew that that was his fault too. I don't know what your story is with Jesus. If you ever run away from him, if you ever left him naked, if you've ever felt like you were all exposed because of your mistakes, but I'm here to tell you that your biography doesn't have to be your story. Come on. And here's my concern. If I could just talk to the men for a moment. W women, I have no idea what goes through your mind. But I know too many men that lay down their gifts for God because of something in their past. And it's time that you lay down your past and pick up your gifts for God. If you fast forward in the story of Mark, you meet him again in the book of Acts. Acts chapter 12, this is the only place that the word mission is ever used in the entire book of Acts. It's the end of chapter 12, Paul and Barnabas, sorry, I need to correct that, Barnabas and Saul, his name wasn't changed yet till chapter 13. And I don't know if you know this, but the reason that Saul became Paul was because Barnabas encouraged him. He took him under his when nobody would touch the apostle Paul. Before he was the apostle Paul, it was Barnabas that escorted him. Now get this. They were in hiding in Jerusalem. This was an underground church. And Barnabas had the audacity to bring Saul of Tarsus in to the house church where they're worshiping. 
That endangered the entire house church. And then he called Saul to come help him in Antioch. I love the story of Antioch. Did you know Antioch, we talked about this yesterday, is the first place that they were called Christians. Because they crossed all of these lines and he needed help, so he brought Saul with him. And they go on a mission of compassion. You've done this as a church. You fed people a lot. You provide for people who are in need. And it says at the end of the chapter, this is the last verse, and Barnabas and Saul returned from Jerusalem when they completed their service, bringing with them John, whose name was Mark. This is important. He had two names. John, Mark. John is his Jewish name. Mark is more of a Greek name. It was common for them to have two names from two different ethnic groups. Look into chapter 3, verse 5. It says, when they arrived at Salamis, they proclaimed the word of God in the synagogues of the Jews, and they had John to assist them. Now, I don't know if he was the youth pastor. I don't know if he was carrying baggage. I don't know what young John Mark was doing, but he was encouraging the team. And Barnabas brought his nephew. I'm assuming it's a nephew. We don't know for sure, but let's just say nephew. He's bringing his young cousin or nephew along, and he's being able to help. What an honor. But John Mark was not there to serve Saul of Tarsus. He was there to serve Barnabas. And then something interesting happened. They walked all across this island of Cyprus, preaching the gospel the entire way, and they come to a city called Paphos. And the leader of that city, he was a big deal. I mean, not John K. Jenkins' big deal, but he was a big deal. He was a proconsul on the island, and his name was Sergius Paulus, Paul. And they brought him to Christ Now, he had an advisor, kind of a magician fellow that objected. And the apostle Paul, in that moment, was so angry. He had done other healings, but he struck this magician blind, which is exactly what Jesus did to Saul to get him to see. So I don't think it was just meanness. I think it was compassion. If you could just see Jesus, you wouldn't stand in his way. And when Sergius Paulus came to Christ, it was the biggest victory that they had had in the church. This was the highest political event. You don't know anything about politics here, do you? Politicians that don't follow Jesus? And now we have one that does? That's a big deal. I think that Paul changed his name to remind himself that his past didn't have to direct his future. So it's time for them to go, and they leave the island, and they go north into what today we call Turkey. It's a very dangerous area. Not just for bandits and robbers, but also malaria and other diseases. It was at that point that Saul becomes Paul, and it was at that point, it says in verse 13, I'll read it for us, now Paul and his companions set sail from Paphos and came to Perga in Pamphylia. John left them and returned to Jerusalem. Uh Uh-oh. Do you see that? He left. Not that we would ever know about a young man who didn't complete a journey. Not that any of y'all know, uh, being a young man, that you dropped the ball, that you left something undone, that you disappointed someone and you tried to recover, but you couldn't recover that relationship. The Apostle Paul was so angry at young John Mark, he refused to reconcile with him. I know what that's like. My Apostle Paul was Bob. Barbara knows him well. He was an older man, the year 2000. He's the one that took me to Israel for the first time. He was a businessman that we traveled together. We did missions work in Russia together. We went to mission work in Jordan together. And while we were in Jordan, I I said something that offended him. I didn't mean to. And if I told you, you would say, well, Bob's just nuts. But he had a pain in his past, and I touched that pain. 
And without knowing I touched that pain, I broke our relationship. I tried to reconcile. I think we'll reconcile in heaven, but he's in heaven now. And so for me, it's a lost relationship. Like I get this with John Mark. Anybody? Does anybody know what I'm talking about? So after another great victory for Barnabas and Saul, it was in Acts 15, and the question was, do people who come to Christ have to be Jews first, or can they just be Christians? Praise God, they answered the question the way they did. You realize what's on the line? So all of you, me included, all of us were included in Christ without having become Jewish, which means which means we get to enjoy bacon. <laughs> Jesus is good at every level, amen? And after that meeting, Paul goes up to Barnabas and says, Barnabas, let's go visit the churches where we preach the gospel. Let's go make sure that they're okay and growing in Christ. Let's disciple them just like you disciple men and women here at this church. And Barnabas said, that's a fantastic idea. And I've got another idea. Let's bring John Mark again. And that went over like a hot dog at Hanukkah. Now, I wasn't there, so I don't know exactly how the conversation went, but it was something like this. Paul, hey, Barnabas, let's go back and visit the churches. That's a great idea. I would love to do that. It's been too long. We need to, we need to build them up, and we need some help. We do need some help. Let's, so I got a helper right here. Let's bring John Mark. No. No, we're not bringing John Mark. Why? He was helpful, but he apostatized. That's the actual Greek word. He apostatized. He did not apostatize. He was a young man that got tired, that got homework, homesick, and part of it was because of you. He wasn't just sick of being homesick. He was sick of you trying to take over the leadership, which Paul did. I don't care. I'm not taking him. Well, I am taking him. What, you think you're in charge of this? Just like I was in charge of the last one. I took charge. I know he's not going. Yes, he is. I am not taking a chance on a young man who is inconsistent and unreliable. You mean you're not going to take a chance on him like I took on you? You wouldn't be the Apostle Paul if it wasn't for me. I just wonder who took a chance on you. There is no second chance without someone taking a chance. And all of us, as Pastor said this morning, all of us have been forgiven of our sins. The hardest thing for me, preaching across the country, the hardest thing for me to convince people of is not the creation of the world by God, it's not even that Jonah would swallow, or Jonah was swallowed by it. Well, hardest thing for me is to convince Christians that they are forgiven. Those were his two big mistakes. And after he went home, I want to tell you what he did. Again, I can't prove this, but as a Bible scholar, I put the historical pieces together. Let me tell you my best guess at what happened. He goes home, and it was at that very time that he went home that Herod Agrippa put James in prison. He beheaded him. It's the first apostle to die. Acts chapter 12, you can fact check me on it. It's a phenomenal story. Herod then said, if the Jews like that I'm killing Christians, I'm going to kill another one. And he put Peter in prison. And Peter, this is amazing. Like, if you've not read the Bible, you've got to read the Bible. The, the best stories are not on Netflix. They're in the Bible. <laughs> Peter is chained to a guard on each side of him. He's going to die the next morning. You know what he's doing? He's sleeping. Because when you have Jesus, you don't have, you, you can get rid of all that anxiety. 
So there he is sleeping, and he was sleeping so hard, the angel had to kick him in the side to wake him up. I'm not making that up, read it. He goes, Peter, wake up. And Peter goes, what? He thought he was dreaming. And he he noticed the shackles had fallen off his arms. And the door opened automatically. That was before automatic doors. And he walks through the door, walks down the street, and he he gets into the city of Jerusalem, and he wakes up, this isn't a dream, this is real life. And he goes, you know whose house he went to? Mary's, John Mark's, and he knocks on the door. Not real loud, because you don't want to wake the neighbors. He is, after all, a fugitive from the law. And the guard at the door, we actually know her name, was Rhoda, means Rose, so little Rose, she's a teenage girl. Why in the world would you put a teenage girl as a guard at your door? I'm gonna tell you why. Teenage girls have two superpower gifts (laughs) that are needed for guards at the door. Number one, your guard needs to stay up all night long. (laughs) Can I get a witness? Second, they need to be able to scream real loud. Hello. And Rhoda comes to the door and she hears Peter's voice. I don't want to insult any teenage girls here, but some of you earn it. She runs away from the door and goes, it's Peter, Peter's at the door, Peter's at the door. And Peter's out there going, could you open the door? And they go open the door and Peter like hushes them. Shh, 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 shh. Because they're waking the neighbors. And he told them, you tell James that I have to go away. And Peter went away, and to this day, we don't know where for sure. I'm a guess. First lady, you know where he went, because you were there with me in Rome, St. Peter's Basilica. Peter goes and preaches in Rome, and I think when John Mark came home from the journey, his mama sent him to go be helpful to the other great apostle, and he did. And because of that, Peter was preaching, and John Mark just started writing notes. And that's why we have the Gospel of Mark. I don't don't know... I don't know if you're aware of this, but most scholars, myself included, believe that Mark was the very first gospel ever written. And I don't know if you know this, but the word gospel is not a religious word. It was a political term. When an emperor or a general had good news, they would send out couriers to tell the people the good news. Hey, good news, the emperor had a baby. We now have an heir to the throne. Good news, the good news. The general won a war. Good news. But here's a peculiarity. The Romans, when they sent out good news, they used the term in the plural, good newses. Well, we only had one baby. Why is it good news? Because there's going to be another emperor. There's going to be another baby. They just won one war, but there's going to be another war. There's always going to be a cycle of other good newses. But when Mark came along, this young guy in Rome had the audacity to compare the good news of Jesus to better news than any general or any emperor in the universe because he is our king of kings and lord of lords and he used it in the singular no Christian ever used good news in the plural because there is only one good news in this world and his name is Jesus the emperor the king of the Jews and our savior Jesus Christ come on So the young boy did all right. I want to read two verses and then tell one story. This is from the Apostle Peter. You know, he wrote a couple letters in the Bible. This is the last thing he wrote in the first letter. She who is at Babylon, is a code name for Rome, who is likewise chosen, sends you greeting, and so does Mark. Hear it now, Mark my son. He had some failure, but at the end of the book, he's called the son of the great apostle Peter. This is even better news for me. 
because I wish that this had happened with me and Bob, but it didn't. The Apostle Paul, and pastor, you remember being where he wrote this. Your pastor was in the cell where the Apostle Paul wrote 2 Timothy. And one of the last things he ever wrote, he said, do your best to come to me. Talking to Timothy. Timothy is the disciple that replaced John Mark as the young helper. He's writing to Timothy. For Demas, in love with this present world, has deserted me and gone to Thessalonica. Crescens has gone to Galatia, Titus to Dalmatia. Paul's saying, I'm all alone. Luke alone is with me. And then he writes this, don't miss this. Get Mark and bring him with you, for he is helpful to me. In preparing for this message, I saw something I'd never seen before. John Mark has two names, right? John Mark, John Mark. John was the name given to the young man that deserted. After Acts 15, you will never read the name John Mark again. He's just Mark. He's just Mark. Just like Saul became Paul, John Mark became Mark. I had a student years ago, his name was Mark Hostetler. He was an identical twin. And Mark and Heath came from a small town in Kansas, and the Hostetler name was a curse word in Kansas because their father had slept with so many women. He had been drunk too much, and he had swindled people out of their money. Hostetler name was a, was a curse name. And as a college student, this young Mark said, I'm going to change the meaning of my name. He and his brother lived holy and godly lives. And today, I have never heard anyone use the Hostetler name except as a compliment. It's time to change your name. And for some of you, it's been generations. It's time to claim the name that God has put on you. Because the name that you will be known by is not the name of your biography, it's the name of your calling. That God has called you gentlemen to be men of integrity for him so that your name, not your past, defines what you do for God because the name that he puts on you is a name that's dripping with the blood of Christ. So when we take communion, we're not just receiving the body and blood of Christ. We're receiving a new name. And that name is Christian. And it is a name appropriate for this hour, for me with you. As one untimely born, I come into your midst invited by your pastor from a different church and a different background and a different geography, but I'm here because there is a name that brings brothers together. doesn't have to be your future what you did yesterday doesn't have to define your tomorrows whatever your past is it's in your past 
We serve a God who can wash the slate clean and forgive you and cleanse you. Isn't that great news? Thank you, sir, for such a profound word. Encourage me. Thank you so much. If there's anybody here tonight that needs a new name, we got a recommendation for somebody to you who can change your name. If you, know, if you don't know the Lord Jesus, we invite you to come and meet him. If you're backslidden and you want to rededicate, we invite you. If you're unsure of your future, we invite you. If you are already say, but you want to be a member of this church, we invite you. This is the time to come. Go ahead, witness to the person next to you. Talk to them uh, and say to them, are you right with God? Are you saved? Do you have a relationship with God? Are you backslidden? Go ahead, talk to the person next to you and ask them and say to them, if you're not sure, I'll walk down there with you. If you're unsaved, I'll walk down there with you. If you're, you need a church home, I'll walk down there with you. Go ahead, let's do that real quick. Amen come right now. Somebody want to get right, want to get saved, want to join church right now will be the perfect time for you to come. This is the moment. more time thank the Lord for Dr. Mark Moore so when we were on this trip to Italy Greece and Israel and Dr. Moore was giving us little many sermons six minute messages at every location that we went to he'd take five or six minutes and talk about that site and what it meant I said to myself I want to hear this man preach a whole sermon <laughs> yeah because he helped to make the New Testament fresh and alive and I want to thank him and his wife for carving out the time and coming to be with us And like we do with everybody else, I want to sow a seed into his ministry, and you have multiple ways to do that. You can go to our Give site and give to the church for a tax-deductible gift, or you can give to him personally. You can give to him directly. It's not tax-deductible, but you can sow it into his cash app, and they're going to put that up on the screen in a, a minute, and you can sow directly into his ministry. Amen. And um, yeah, I wish they could put that up a little bigger that's so small uh or, or venmo or zell okay venmo it, mark mark next time y'all do this it has to be bigger because i can't i can barely read it mark more 330 at gmail.com 
So that's too small uh, for me. <laughs> and I know if it's too small for me, it's too small for some other people too. But I want to sow a seed into his ministry and his life, so I want to ask you to do that. Let's pray. Father, thank you for this opportunity to receive a profound challenge that our biography does not define our destiny. Pray for you to replenish Dr. Moore. Pray that you bless every giver who gives and sows. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you. We're going to enter into our communion at this time. Um, let's see. You know, when you get old, you can't remember what you're supposed to do next. Do we do our covenant next? I think our covenant is next. Y'all going to have to help me out. So let's let's prepare into our covenant. Is that in that next? Is it next? Okay. All right. We're going to do our covenant next. Praise him. Let's affirm this covenant together. Having been led as we believe by the Spirit of God to receive the Lord Jesus Christ as our Savior and on the profession of our faith, having been baptized in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, we do now, in the presence of God, angels in this assembly, most solemnly and joyfully, enter into covenant with one another as one body in Christ. We engage therefore by the aid of the Holy Spirit to walk together in Christian love, to strive for the advancement of this church in knowledge, holiness, and comfort, to promote its prosperity and spirituality, to sustain its worship, ordinances, discipline, and doctrines, 
to, and to contribute cheerfully and regularly to the support of the ministry, the expenses of the church, the relief of the poor, and the spread of the gospel through all nations. We also engage to maintain family and secret devotions, to religiously educate our children, to seek the salvation of our kindred and acquaintances, to walk circumspectly in the world, to be just in our dealings, faithful in our engagements, and exemplary in our deportment, to avoid all tattling, backbiting, and excessive anger to abstain from the sale and use of intoxicating and behavior-altering substances for recreational purposes, and to be zealous in our efforts to advance the kingdom of our Savior. We further engage to watch over one another in brotherly love, to remember each other in prayer, to aid each other in sickness and distress, to cultivate Christian sympathy and feeling and courtesy in speech, to be slow to take offense, but always ready for reconciliation and mindful of the rules of our Savior to secure it without delay. We moreover engage that when we remove from this place, we will as soon as possible unite with some other church where we can carry out the spirit of this covenant and the principles of God's word. And now unto him, who brought again from the dead, our Lord Jesus, be power and glory forever. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. Our leaders are coming at this time, and uh, we're going to take a moment and uh, introduce our elders and our leaders. And um, then we'll welcome our new members. elders are on this end of the, t of the line. This is Elder Wilbur Barham. Take your mask off so they can see what you look like, elders, so they know who you is. This is the vice chair of our elders. It's Elder James Johnson. Elder Stanley Featherstone. Elder and Reverend Thomas H. Sims, Jr. And there's some of our other elders that are missing today. We'll hold them up in prayer. Uh, Elder Sanford uh, is uh, missing uh, today. Keep him in your prayers. This is um, the First Lady of the First Baptist Church, who is the Chief Ministry Officer, <laughs> Trina Jenkins. I helped Ministry Department Director Helen Bryant. Our Missions Ministry Director, Reverend Belinda Gentry. Our Education and Training Director, Reverend Esther Gordon, and soon to be one of our first female elders at the First Baptist Church of Denmark. The President of our nonprofit entity, Shabbat Ministries, Reverend Cynthia Terry. Our Music and Arts Director, Reverend Stephen Hurd. The chairman of our, our deacons ministry, take your mask off uh, so that everybody can see what you look like. Put it back on. <laughs> <laughs> that was a joke. I'm just joking. Deacon Mark Rhines, he knows I love him. I'm just playing with him. <laughs> and the chairwoman of our deaconess ministry, deaconess Bridget Smith. If you are here today and you're getting the right hand of fellowship, please stand. I, I don't know exactly how many people we have, but if you're here, stand. So uh, just keep standing. Our members around you are going to come and show you some love and welcome you to the First Baptist Church. That's our new right hand of fellowship. They're going to dap you up and welcome you to our church. We know you've, is that a good word, dap you up? Is that, 
Okay. They're going to show you some love. Um, your being here today and accepting membership means you've, you've completed our new members class and you are in agreement with our uh, policies and beliefs and the commitments that we ask you to make. So, uh, and we're going to also gonna put the names up on the screen. And I'm sorry I didn't get the number of how many people we have. Uh, does anybody have that number? Let me see. How many? 32. 32 members being added to the First Baptist Church. Of Thank you. All right, y'all go show them some love. Y'all go show them some love, and uh, the names will be across the screen. There you go. Dr. Moore to pray over this our time together. It is good to be in the house of the Lord. It is good to come together with brothers and sisters under the one name of Jesus. It is not lost on us the sacredness of these emblems. And as we take the broken body of our Lord we receive not only his body, but his forgiveness. And when we take the cup of juice and we drink it into ourselves, we receive his blood as a new name on us. Lord, would you mark us as the, your people with unity, with power, with love, with sacrifice, with humility, and would the favor of your Holy Spirit rest on us in this place to be bold proclaimers of the salvation of Jesus Christ. For this, for this city, for the state of Maryland, for Washington, D.C., would you help your people 
be the light of the world and the salt of the earth as we take your body in ourselves for fellowship, unity, and love. We pray in the powerful name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. This bread, this bread is a reminder to us of the body of the Lord Jesus, that he who knew no sin became sin for us, took upon himself the punishment that we all deserve, and in remembrance of his body being crucified for us, let us eat together. Amen. This cup is the blood of our Lord Jesus Christ shed for us. We receive it in his name with a pledge of obedience and fidelity to him and to each other. Can I ask you to be seated for one minute? Just one minute. Let me first of all express my gratitude on behalf of my wife and I and the leaders of this church for your unwavering support for the First Baptist Church of Glen Arden. You all have been wonderful supporters. Thank you for your involvement. Thank you for coming back in the midst of all this COVID drama and uh, being supportive of the things that we're trying to do. Thank those of you who support the love offering that takes care of me and my wife which she's very grateful that there's food in the kitchen and a roof over her head. We're very grateful for that support. I'm so grateful to have two of my sons here today who are pastoring Pastor Bobby Manning and Pastor, stand up Bobby, and his wife, Lavera, and their sons, the whole family's here today. God bless you tonight. Thank y'all for being here. And we're also grateful to have uh, the pastor of the, uh, is it Laurel, what's the name? Bethany, you know, I can't even remember the name. Bethany Church. Um, 
Nate Yates, Nathaniel Yates. Stand up, Pastor Yates. And I, people don't think I'm, you know, I know they think I forget. Uh, just a few weeks ago, a couple of weeks ago, Pat, uh, Reverend John Sawyer was officially voted in as the pastor of the Mount Calvary Baptist Church. So we celebrate him. So you'll be hearing about his installation soon, and we're very excited for God's call upon his life. Okay, you can stand back up. Y'all can go. Go home. Just go home. Goodbye. Good night. I love you in Jesus' name. God bless you. Oh. Huh? Oh, oh, oh. Dr. Uh, Moore bought some books with him. Uh, Quest 52. Uh, come here for a minute. Come here just a moment and tell him, tell him about the books real quick. Core 52, the 52 most important verses of all the Bible. Quest 52, a journey through the life of Jesus in one year. I'll be your guide. Good night, everybody. We love you. In Jesus' name.